Hello, I'm George Zaharoff, and I thought I'd take a moment and introduce myself. In order to give you the present, you have to understand the past and where this all started. I have two older brothers and a younger sister, so I'm number three in my family. I was born in Chicago. My parents came from Greece to the States with a dream of a better life. Around when I was four or five years old, my mother enrolled at the Chicago, uh, the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, she majored in, in fashion design. She started out of the basement of the house. I remember it was probably in diapers at the time. I remember being in third or fourth grade and her making my teacher's uh, bicentennial outfits. Success came very quickly for her. Uh, she started by herself and then all of a sudden we had five, six women in the basement making clothing. And from there she moved uh, into the city, got a showroom in a factory, selling to about 500 stores in the United States as well as outside of the United States. Some of her accounts were iMagnon, Bonwit Teller, Neiman Marcus, Saks Fifth Avenue. It was during that time also that she was doing wardrobe for Knott's Landing, Dynasty in Dallas, Showtime. There was even a White House wedding when Patty Davis got married in one of my mother's wedding dresses. She should have taken me with to that wedding, by the way. She didn't take me. So through that, throughout this whole period of my childhood, I grew up in bolts of fabric, playing, playing in the silks and the cashmeres, and my mother would travel the world and she would bring my sister, my younger sister and myself, things from far off corners of the world. And back then, you know, Bangkok or Dubai or Hong Kong was very far away. And she would uh, bring me back things uh, and she sometimes took us on these trips. Growing up, I was told two things. One would be that I would never be tall because I was a small child and little boys do not grow up to be fashion designers. Literally, I remember being told that. I remember being, well, George, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I said, I want to be a fashion designer. And I remember being told, oh no, George, little boys don't become fashion designers. You want to be a fireman or a doctor? And I would say, no, I want to be a fashion designer. And by the way, I'm six foot four now. I'm the tallest one in my entire family. And from that point on, I had one big dream and many battles to fight to get to that dream. Imagine this, 18, 19 years old, I'm a senior at DePaul University and I was trying to figure out how I could get my foot into this business. And what I did was, uh, my junior year at DePaul University, I majored in operations management and manufacturing and purchasing. What I did was, is I wrote to the consulate of France and Italy, the commercial attaché at that time, and this was before emails, and I asked them for a list of all the mills and manufacturers of clothing, uh, high-end clothing specifically. What came back from the, the, this mass mailing were faxes and letters from mills in Italy that wanted to work with me. And so I made Milano my base the moment I graduated DePaul at the age of 20. And how I know this is because I remember being in meetings and them saying, how old are you, are you 20? And I said, I'm 20, 20. And they're like, oh my God, you're so young. And it was like I cast a wide net to see how I could get this jump started. And that's one thing that I've always done. I take seeds, I throw it to the ground, and I see what sprouts and what grows. Another key player in this, besides my mother, was my childhood friend, uh, Milan Georgievic. I've known him since kindergarten. We went to school together all the way through grammar school, high school. Uh, he went to Loyola, I went to DePaul, and then we came together to start the fashion house in Milan. We did this for about five years, going between Paris, Milan, London, and Athens. It was like taking a commuter train to work, just going between these cities. And so we started showing in the Milan runway shows, and it was when I took a piece of clay, uh, I made it into a design of a bottle, 
I took a little wood cap and I worked with the chief perfumer of one of the finest perfume houses in the world. And I created this, I created Zaharoff Pour Femme. I created a fragrance under the Zaharoff name for women. And what I did was, is I called Nordstrom up and I go, actually what I did was I called the store manager of the Oak Brook store. And I said, you know what, can I meet with you please? And we set a meeting, we sit down and I go, now look, I've just been playing with this. I don't know what I want to do quite yet. I don't know if this is going to work. And so I show him this little sprayer, the wood cap and the bottle, and he sprayed the women's fragrance. And I remember it filling the room up, his face lit up. And he picked up the phone and he called, at that time, Dale Crichton on speakerphone. And she said, you have to meet this guy. So what happened was, it's like, oh yes, that would be great. I will meet with him. And so I left the Oak Brook store like, wow, this is really cool. And at that time I was like 22 years old. And I called Nordstrom Corporate and I've always been this way. I've always been assertive, but in a very nice and gentlemanly way. I called, no response back. I called, left a message, nothing. So finally what I said was, hi, my name is Rosa Harov. I just want you to know I'm so excited to show you this fragrance that I'm going to be there Friday at 2 o'clock to show you at your offices in Seattle. And within five minutes, I got the call saying, no, 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 don't come Friday at 2, come next Tuesday at 1. And that's what happened. I got on a plane, I showed them the fragrance, and they said, don't take it anywhere else. We want this as an exclusive. I remember turning to Milan after my meeting and going, Milan, I, I, what just happened here? I wonder if this is going to change our lives. And so what I did was is I took the uh, emphasis out of the base in Milan. We moved back to the United States and we started the fragrance company. And at that time, we only were able to produce 300 bottles. Uh, so it ended up in one door at Oak Brook, Illinois. And I had to go from one door to three doors to five doors to you know 20 doors throughout the country and then the entire chain and then from there we started selling to Bergdorf Goodman and then five Neiman Marcuses and then the entire chain things happened so quickly the next thing I knew we were selling to duty free in the Middle East the Caribbean and Latin America and so we opened up 150 stores in the United States and abroad and we quickly grew to the top five selling fragrance in all our accounts and we never left that slot so it happened very quickly in 2000 I partnered with a luxury brand out of uh, Naples Italy to produce men's tailored clothing suits shirts and ties and so that for me was really exciting to branch out outside of the fragrance arena and into clothing because that's where my passion, actually now I can say my passion is fragrance too, but I wanted to design clothing as well. And what happened was, is I was at a chance dinner party given by Prince Albert of Monaco in Monte Carlo, and I sat across the president of Escada Beute and his fabulous wife. We hit it off from the start. And I told him before I left, I go, you know what, we, we should do something together. I go, we, I feel this energy and I, I wish we could do something together. And the next thing you knew, I was back home and Nordstrom had done a billboard of the women's fragrance with a Descada bottle. And I took a picture of it on the expressway, I stopped the car, Milan and I, and we took a picture of it after like, oh my God, it's our billboard. And so I sent it to the president of Escada. His name was Claude Paladin. And I wrote, meant to be with a question mark. All the while this was happening in August of 2001 amongst all the vendors, and there were a lot of them, Zaharoff won the Vendor of the Year Award at Neiman Marcus. And this is really an incredible uh, period for, for the brand and for myself. And so, the negotiations were over with Escada, and they said, okay, we're ready to go. Be in New York to sign the contract, and then we'll hand it over. So it was really a big deal for me. As I was getting ready for my meeting in Chicago, I was going to fly out there in the morning and then fly back home in the evening. I got a call, and it was from my sister, 
in Los Angeles. And at that time, the caller IDs were on the phone. And I said, I thought to myself, what is Katrina calling me so early? It's like six o'clock in the morning over there in Los Angeles where she lived. And she said, George, you have to turn on the TV. And that's when I saw the second plane crash into the North Tower. And then my whole world changed. So right after 9-11, you had the airports closed. We were told to be careful going to shopping malls or to go see a movie. And it was a very strange time, especially when it came to retail. There were many unknowns. And because of this, Escada was also affected. And they put a stop, an indefinite hold on the contract, which was very difficult for me. And from September to December, I tried to find another way to make that work, but it was unsuccessful. And I ended up having to close everything down. I also had a warehouse full of product and I destroyed it because I did not want to, I did not want to be tempted to sell it into the gray market. And, uh, and I wanted to hold the integrity of the Zaharoff brand. And you know, something interesting is that when, when that did happen, you know, the whole country found out because it was a ripple effect. And so, because we had told, and Escada had told them all the accounts, all the stores that they were taking over the Zahara brand. And so when they put me on an indefinite hold, uh, was very difficult. The one thing though that really left an impression on me was on top of all this, uh, I'm a very private person, so I wouldn't call and say, oh my God, poor me, I'm going through this. I would just say, I'm getting through a difficult time, and that was it. So I wasn't one to voice whatever I was going through. And I remember towards the end of 2001, I had a group of friends in Chicago who comprised of mostly successful, you know, lawyers and doctors and the such. And they turned, one of them turned to me and said that I couldn't be in that group anymore because I was not successful enough for them. And I think that was very difficult for me. Uh, it took me a little bit of time, even when I got my, I got back on my feet within a year and, but that left such a, a sting that I just moved down with my life. And I said, you know what? Rather than focus on the social, I'm, I want to see the world. And that's what I did. I took that list that I wrote as a child. Um, so by the way, when I, was, uh, when I was in high school, I wrote a list of all the cities I wanted to go to. I dreamt of going to, so I would draw a route map and I would put little lines from cities. And so I took that list and I literally just said, okay, I want to see the world. And over the course of eight years, I went and saw it. Now we're in early 2002, and uh, I had to heal a little bit, but I knew that it was time for me to brush off the dust off my shoulders, shine my little crown, and to move on. And it was then the executives 
from the buying office and corporate uh, Nordstrom had witnessed everything that had transpired. And one of them came to me and said, hey, you know what, what about those men's suits? Because I had started in 2001 with that. And those suits were with Neiman Marcus. It was from a very high-end name that was producing them. And I remember walking the floor and someone coming up to me and saying, hey, wow, that suit is beautiful. And I was like, oh my God, it's mine. And they're like, would you ever think of selling to Nordstrom? I go, let me get through with the sale and I'll get back to you. And so he picked up the phone and the next thing you know, I am on Wacker Drive with my suits in plastic bags going to the Hart Marks building to show Homie Patel, who was either the chairman or the CEO of the time of Hart Marks. And within two weeks, I had signed a license agreement with Copley Apparel Group out of Hamilton, Ontario. And I was so excited with it that you can't even imagine. And within uh, three months, I was back in the stores. The license uh, covered men's tailored clothing category. And men's tailored clothing is uh, suitings, which is suits, shirts, sport jackets, other furnishings like ties and neckwears and cufflinks and scarves, leather goods, and also outerwear, which is coats and jackets, and, uh, and then formal wear, which is tuxedos, bow ties, cummerbunds, and vests. Another company handled the license for the women's tailored clothing, which was equally successful all which made it into the stores and I lasted a good seven years and it was until May of 2009 I woke up to an email saying that Hartmarks filed bankruptcy and for the conditions of my contract they were ending the license because of the uncertainty of where they were gonna go who they ended up being sold now I had all these orders and I didn't have anyone to fulfill them it was quite daunting because it takes an industry to create a suit. You know, 70 people touch a suit, a men's suit, when it's made. At least mine were being touched by 70 people. Just by chance, uh, a large retail group had purchased a manufacturing facility that produced tailored clothing, and they approached me and said, you're gonna be our first license, and we are here to work with you to grow and I was thrilled with that. Uh, from this period on, I can't tell you what else happened, but I could say to you where I am recording this, I'm a free agent and I'm excited. I also was very fortunate to, to work on some really incredible projects. Uh, one of them is uh, helping design and create products for the, a museum in St. Petersburg, Russia. Um, I was uh, in a project uh, where I designed jewelry for a French company. I branded packaging for some smaller companies and even a celebrity jewelry brand at Sam's Club, which was pretty, pretty interesting. I also worked with companies like Boeing for uh, airline livery, which I had a lot of fun with as well. You know, it's interesting, in my 20s, um, I, my early 20s, I took up uh, Transcendental Meditation. And it's where I found peace during these times of my meditation. And I would dream about the person that I wanted to become. Um, or Napoleon Hill said, you know, the person you intend to become. So I dreamt about this person I, I intended to become. And I just thought A to B, straight line, I'll get there. And I didn't realize that in order for me to become that person that I dreamt of, I had to go through the ups and downs, the trials and the tribulations, the successes and the failure, to become tough and strong and not naive, yet humble and creative. I always, I always connected to the tree that's by itself in the middle of a, a field, getting hit by the elements. The bark gets tough, it gets strong, as opposed to a tree surrounded by other trees in the rainforest where the big trees are blocking its sunlight. It doesn't grow as strong and uh, it's more susceptible to the, um, the elements. I try to look at things though with the same eye I had when I was seven years old. I still want to look at things and see the beauty in things to see the good in people. So even with 104 countries under my belt, 
I still have the same excitement when I pull up at any airport as I did when I was a child. After all, to me it's all about the journey and the unlimited possibilities that await because at any given time something can change and, and that to me I find just thrilling. Okay, so why all this? Why am I sharing this all with you? And it's because I'm embarking on a new journey and we live in a day and age where we want to know. We want to know how things are done, who's doing it, why they're doing it. And in order for me to take the next journey, uh, which I'm about to embark on, I want you to be a part of that, for you to come with me and we do this together. I don't know where it's going to take us, but I promise you we're going to have fun along the way.